of them are fuel, some of them are fuel generating, um, fuel reducing or oxidizing uh, reactions. Um, and enzymes are very selective. So um, selectivity can be an issue with complex reactions for artificial catalysts, but enzymes for most part are nature um, has evolved them to be very selective for particular reactions. Uh, they catalyze a wide range of reactions and they're very energy efficient. So uh, nature has figured out ways to move electrons and protons and, and so on around uh, in a way that doesn't require a lot of driving force. Um, and so uh, in organisms, the electrons flow to and from enzymes via these kind of biochemical diffusion limited torturous pathways. Uh, and so what we're uh, looking to do is to drive enzymes directly with light using nanostructures. And I list here some other people um, who work in this area, including Tim. Um, and so, um, you know, enzymes may not be practical to do all kinds of catalysis with enzyme. Maybe some of the higher value uh, reactions are, uh, but there's a lot we can learn about catalysis from um, learning how to drive enzyme catalysis. Okay, uh, so why we're using semiconductor nanocrystals for this purpose, there's several reasons. One is that they're very strong light absorbers and you'll see why that's important shortly. Of course, we have the well-known uh, tunability of energy levels with size, shape and composition due to quantum confinement. So we can tune driving forces and so on for reactions. Um, there's a lot of uh, tunability in the surface chemistry. So when we think about interfacing nanocrystals and enzymes, uh, it's helpful that there's well-developed surface chemistry for nanocrystals. And also their kind of size, their size is on the order of size of enzymes. And so here's, for example, a rod that's, you know, like four or five nanometers in diameter. Um, and so we can think about making colloidal uh, hybrids. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I'll be talking mostly about nanorods as the, the light absorbers, cadmium sulfide nanorods. And I just want to uh, point you to a recent review where um, it's more than 50 pages long. Uh, you know, everything you ever wanted to know about uh, two six uh, nanorod shaped nanocrystals uh, and their uh, electronic and excited state properties. Um, and you know, they're, they're very strong light absorbers due to their sheer size, but also their quasi one dimensional shape. Um, and they have the right energy level alignment for the, the reactions that we're interested in driving. Um, we also do some work with quantum dots uh, and there we have more tunability, have light, less light absorption, but more tunability in the energy levels because of the three dimensional quantum confinement. So there's more um, dynamic range in the um, energy levels. Okay. Uh, so, um, I'm going to uh, summarize in the talk three redox enzyme systems that we've been working with. So we, we really cut our teeth on this, these uh, systems that combine nanocrystals with the enzyme hydrogenase in collaboration with Paul King at NREL. And this is a somewhat uh, arguably the simplest reaction uh, uh, for the, these kinds of uh, systems is um, two protons going to hydrogen with two electrons coming from semi, uh, semiconductor nanocrystals. Um, and then um, I will then move on to talk about a, a much more complex uh, reaction, which is a carbon-carbon bond formation uh, with CO2 reduction that's catalyzed by a, a different family of enzymes. And this is with Sean Elliott at Boston University. And then I'll go into an even more complicated eight electron, eight proton reaction that is a reduction of nitrogen to ammonia. And that is with Paul King. And then two um, nitrogenase experts, Lance Seafeld and John Peters. All right, so um, let's start with the hydrogenase. And although some of this work is not very recent, it's really foundational in terms of the concepts, you know, laying the groundwork for how these systems work. So I do wanna highlight some key things um, from the hydrogenase system. So the first thing that we need to think about is how do we actually put these two things together in nanocrystals and enzymes? And so we take kind of a biomimetic approach. And what I mean by that is that we're trying to impersonate the um, natural electron donor for these enzymes. So in nature for redox enzymes, often the active site is buried inside the nanocrystal. So in this case, this is the hydrogenase. Uh, so the chemistry actually happens um, like pretty far into the enzyme. And then there are these iron sulfur clusters that act as electron relays. So in nature, there's a small protein called paradoxin that injects electrons at this uh, 
particular site. Um, and the way this works is via an electrostatic interaction. So this is a charge map of the enzyme and it's mostly negatively charged, but there is this positively charged pocket and that's where ferrodoxin comes in and injects an electron. And remember, two electrons to make a hydrogen. Okay, so we basically modify nanocrystals to look like ferrodoxin electrostatically. They have uh, carboxylate groups on the surface. This is the well-known um, uh, mercaptocarboxylate ligands. And so they, they have that ability to absorb. So I kind of just want to uh, take a moment to point out, you know, that this, this is an electrostatic interaction that creates uh, colloids. Um, and one of the big challenges in our work is making colloidally stable systems because, you know, nanocrystal uh, enzymes require uh, buffers and there's a lot, you know, pretty high ionic strength in solutions. So there's quite a bit of tinkering, you know, just to get things uh, to be colloidally stable. So if you're interested in this kind of work, um, we are very happy to talk to you and help you uh, get it working because <laughs> there's a lot of different ways that you can just get everything to precipitate. Okay, so we have things in solution colloidally stable. Um, so the kinetics, uh, the, the kinetics of, that are relevant uh, for these photochemical reactions occur on several time scales. So I kind of want to break this down into uh, the important step. Okay, so the first step obviously is the excitation of nanocrystals. And under kind of typical solar intensity conditions, this would be on the order of you know, one photon every millisecond, okay? And the enzymes, depending on what enzyme it is, they can operate on time scales of, you know, milliseconds to a second. Um, and so, you know, if every photo excited electron went straight, you know, went into the enzyme, then the rate of electron injection into the enzyme would simply be equal to the rate of photo excitation. Uh, but that's not always the case because of course, um, electron injection into the enzyme competes with the electron hole recombination. So that's the, that's, uh, that competition is defined by the quantum efficiency of electron transfer. Okay, so that's the competition between the electron transfer and all the other decay pathways for the electron. And so there, in the end, the rate at which the enzymes receive electrons depend both on the excitation rate, which is easily tunable just by changing our light intensity and that competition between electron transfer and recombination. Okay, so, um, and then of course, we also have to harvest these holes. So these, this, we um, so far are always doing sacrificial reactions where we're not doing anything particularly useful with holes, uh, but we are harvesting them with various kinds of hole scavenging and the time scales there are basically uh, not particularly fast, but they're fast enough to keep up with uh, photo excitations so that, um, you know, so that the nanocrystal can be regenerated be before the next uh, photo excitation. Okay. So, um, you know, because of this importance of the electron transfer efficiency to the overall uh, product formation, we've We've really focused on understanding the kinetics of electron transfer, so the rate constants uh, and the efficiencies. Okay, so um, so in principle, this is very easy to figure out with uh, things like transient absorption spectroscopy. So we have, um, you know, this is well known that um, we have these strong uh, bleach signals in in semiconductor nanocrystals uh, at the band gap that correspond. Uh, Mostly, so this this is getting figured out now. But you know, for our purposes, they're co it's corresponding to the electron dynamics, and and so you know we have certain relaxation of the electrons and the nanocrystals, and then when there's an enzyme that accepts an electron, of course, the lifetime gets shortened. Um, so a couple of things to note: um, this is work of Molly Wilker, my first graduate student. Um, there, the time scale for relaxation is really long, okay? 100 femtoseconds we're looking at is our time resolution to 10 um, microseconds. And so, you know, this is a highly multi-exponential uh, decay and there, there are several things going on. And so, you know, one of the things we, first things we need to figure out is how to actually extract the electron transfer kinetics from these kinds of highly multi-exponential decays in nanocrystals um, alone and with uh, enzymes absorbed. And so um, the reason why these decays are uh, multi-exponential has to do with both properties of the nanocrystals and of the um, 
of the uh, nanocrystal enzyme complexes. So let's just briefly review some of the photophysics of these kinds of nanorods. Okay, so here's our flat irons. This is my lab. We, we, have, we have a view of the flat irons. Uh, and we have our colloidal solution of the, um, of the cadmium sulfide nanorods. Okay, so remember the process we're interested in is the electron transfer from the nanorod to the enzyme. Um, and again, remember that there are ligands on the surface, these mercaptopropionic acids in this case. So upon excitation, the first thing that happens, and we're not actually gonna discuss it here, uh, we work on this in a separate project, is the whole trapping of photoexcited holes very, very fast, sub picosecond time scale. Uh, they're trapping to um, calcogen sites on the surface. So in the end, what we have is kind of a delocalized, you know, after cooling, after a picosecond, we have a delocalized electron um, and a, a surface trapped hole. <clears throat> Okay, and then it is also possible to have incomplete ligand coverage. So we have like a under passivated cadmium site and that is an electron trap. And so, uh, you know, there are at least three pathways for a cooled uh, electron recombination of a trapped hole, electron transfer to the enzyme and the electron itself can be trapped. So, you know, if these, if, if every nanorod was the same and had the same number of enzymes and the same number of traps, we would still have a single exponential decay. But um, the reason we don't is that there's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the sample. Uh, so the first um, point of heterogeneity is that, um, there's a distribution in the binding of enzymes to the nanocrystals. And so this is the example of hydrogenase. And we've, um, uh, we've described this as a Poisson distribution, uh, at least for when the nanocrystals are large enough. And a Poisson distribution is something, um, is, describes a process where the probability of absorption of the enzyme is um, independent of whether there's one already there. And so, with other kinds of nanocrystals, we use different kinds of uh, population distributions. But the one thing that's really uh, kind of um, jarring about this, if you if you don't think about distributions a lot, is that if we have on average one enzyme per nanorod, uh, Poisson distribution is such that actually the number of rods with no enzyme and the rods with one enzyme is the same. Okay, so this kind of average of one to one is, is like not at all representative of what's going on in solution. In fact, you know, there's just as many rods with no enzyme and then some with two, three, and four, and so on. Okay, so, you know, this has uh, implications for quantitative analysis because, of course, the, the decay of these nanorods and the their light absorption and lack of product formation, all of that, you know, really enters into the, the behavior of our ensemble. Now, why do we have these distributions? Is because we have this electrostatic interaction so that when we uh, mix the two components together, they're interacting in stochastic fashion. So we don't have, you know, targeted directed binding. It really is this um, stochastic interaction. At least at this moment, we don't have direct binding. Okay, targeted binding. So, okay, we have a distribution there. Um, there's also distribution, the number of electron traps. This is known in the literature that that's a Poisson distribution as well. And so when we take into account these Poisson distributions of enzymes and traps, you know, and we think about the three pathways that I'd mentioned before, um, then uh, by putting in these distributions, the expression for the excited state decay that's very multi-exponential simplifies, simplifies significantly, okay? And this is, um, comes from the literature. Um, and, and this is work of James Utterback, um, my, one of my former students who figured out all this uh, analytical modeling. Um, and you know, in the end, it comes down to the rate constants for the three processes of interest, and then the average number of traps and the average number of enzymes. So basically, because a Poisson distribution is completely defined by its average, the math really simplifies, and we have you know like a phys physical sensible expression uh, uh, for the excited state decay that allows us to extract the rate constants for these processes. So we're going to keep using this with all the enzyme systems. Okay. So anyway, it, it works and it, it gives us the rate constants for these, um, for all the processes. So in the case of hydrogenase with those ligands I talked about, 
Um, the electron transfer is like on the same order of magnitude as electron hole recombination. So they're in direct competition. The electron trapping is actually a little bit faster. And so, you know, for each nanorod, it's going to the electron transfer efficiency to the enzyme is going to depend on how many enzymes and, and uh, traps it has. Um, but we don't study individual nanorods, we study, um, we study um, ensembles. And so um, James figured out how to um, describe an electron transfer and any kind of quenching efficiency in the ensemble where there is a multi-exponential donor decay or a non-single non exponential donor decay. So it turns out that this textbook definition of electron transfer efficiency or any kind of quenching efficiency as a ratio of um, rate constant for that process over the sum of rate constants for all the other decay pathways only works when the donor has a single exponential decay. Okay, so it does not work for us because we have those multi-exponential decay. And I'm very sorry about this. The bleach is now upside down. That's why uh, it's decaying this way. It's just multiplied by minus one. So what James Utterback uh, derived, um, and this really was his initiative, is an expression, a general expression for a quenching of, oops, excuse me. Um, I'll go back. Um, is a general expression for a quenching efficiency that does not actually require an analytical model for an excited state decay, but depends solely on the signal intensities of the, um, the survival probability or just the signal intensity of the donor, um, as well as the uh, donor acceptor pair. And so I hope this is useful to other people because well, you know, non-single exponential decays are very common in nanocrystals and in other systems. So, um, Take note if, if you have these issues. But anyway, so now we have a way of, of measuring quantitatively electron transfer efficiencies in these complex excited state the case. All right, so now that we have that in place, uh, now we can compare electron transfer efficiency and product formation and find out how important is electron transfer efficiency to the product formation. And it turns out it is critically important. And in the case of hydrogenase, the quantum yield of product formation is about the same as the efficiency of electron transfer. And so, and we see that we have a linear turnover frequency as a function of um, photon flux. Um, this is just excitation rate, basically. Um, so what this is telling us is that this enzyme is so good at turning over the electrons um, that it, it simply all that matters is uh, whether it receives an electron from a nanocrystal. Okay, and so that means that the rate of hydrogen production is really just that product is equal to the rate of electron injection, which I told you before, depending on excitation frequency and electron transfer efficiency. So, I mean, this sort of makes sense from the standpoint of nature because these enzymes normally operate under conditions of low electron flux because they are, you know, solar elimination is um, not, not that strong and it's diffuse. And so they're usually getting electrons at low fluxes. And so they're able to hold on to individual electrons for example, for hydrogenase to make a hydrogen molecule, you can sit, there's like a half, you know, half reduced state with one electron on it and one proton that's quite stable and can sit there and wait for the next electron. Okay. So, you know, processes like back electron transfer, very, very slow, unlike uh, what you'd see in, in kind of synthetic catalysts. Okay. So, Enzyme just cares about receiving electrons. So how can we control that efficiency of electron transfer? It depends most strongly on the ratio of electron transfer to recombination rate constants, kind of obviously. Um, and so, you know, you probably were already thinking this, like, hey, you have these organic ligands that sit between your nanorod and your electron injection site, which is this iron sulfur cluster. And we indeed, indeed, we see that the electron transfer rate constant um, depends exponentially on the ligand length. And so really the key to uh, enhancing electron transfer efficiency is um, making the ligands um, shorter and shorter. And uh, we don't have time to go, we've worked on this quite a bit. I, I can debate, we, we can talk later if there are questions about um, some of the challenges in changing the ligands. Okay, so I just wanna kind of end there, the hydrogenase story just to point out again this, um, 
this thing, the enzyme is just so good at turning over electrons. It's a fast catalysis. And so it's just sitting there waiting for the electrons to come in. So what matters is just the, the competition between electron transfer and recombination. So to contrast that, I'm gonna now move on quickly to the carbon-carbon bond formation reaction. Okay, so these are enzymes called oxoacid ferredoxin oxidoreductases. doesn't really matter. Um, my collaborator, Sean Elliott works on them. And what they do is they take a CO2 um, and they bind and make a, a uh, reduce, make a new carbon-carbon bond, and it's a family of enzymes, and they also use ferredoxin as electron donors. And so we did a very similar thing with this enzyme, uh, you know, nanorods with the same ligands, okay, and um, the enzyme, again, has an iron sulfur cluster with the electron injection presumably goes to, and then the active site is an organic species, actually, and the enzyme is a dimer. And so, again, the chemistry is succinyl group uh, bound to coenzyme A and CO2 is going into um, CO2 reduction and carbon-carbon bond formation. It takes two electrons to do this. Okay, so... Um, the first kind of striking difference between the system and the hydrogenase is that I showed you before the hydrogenase turnover frequency was linear with excitation frequency. Um, and here we have a saturation behavior. Okay, and the saturation behavior is the saturation turnover frequency is the same as that of the natural system that's ferredoxin driven. And it simply has to do with the fact that this is a much lower enzyme. It's, it's making large molecule um, transformations. And so it just operates at a slower rate. So that's fine, no problem. Uh, and then this here is the electron transfer and electron flux limited regime. But what's interesting here is that the quantum yield of product formation is quite, quite low. Okay, it's only 1%. And so we looked into why, you know, what whether this has to do with the electron injection again. Um, and when we look at the Electron transfer, you know, with nanorods and the enzyme, it's actually like somewhat similar to what we would see with hydrogenase. Uh, but the big difference is that when we bind the substrate succinyl CoA uh, to the active site, and that is thought to be the first step of catalysis, actually the succinyl CoA binding, and then uh, the electron would come in. Um, then we see the electron transfer really shut down and get much, much less efficient. Okay, and so um, this is something that we scratched our heads about for a long time, okay? And I just wanna kind of point out the sizes here. So the enzyme is you know, about twice as, as big as the nanorod, but the molecule that's binding at the active site is you know, quite big. It's a quarter of the size of the enzyme. This is the succinyl piece, and this is the coenzyme A. And so before hydrogenase was turning over protons to hydrogen, so, you know, that's not a perturbation to a structure of the enzyme, but this is a large molecule uh, transformation. This is work of uh, former student Hayden Hamby. Um, and we see evidence that what's happening when this um, Coenzyme co substrate binds is in, in, we see basically that it sort of weakens the binding between the nanocrystal and the enzyme. In the interest of time, I'll skip through. I'll just, just say that that's the evidence from dynamic light scattering uh, that when the substrate binds, the actual weakens the um, binding between nanocrystal and the enzyme. So we scratched our heads about this for a long time, about why that might be. And the key information came from um, Sean Elliott's group and Kathy Drennan, who got the crystal structure of both the enzyme and the, and the with the substrate bound and without. And what they saw is that there is like a fairly significant conformational change that happens with the substrates binds. Because again, it's a huge perturbation to you know, such a big molecule and it perturbs the structure. And so we think it's basically impacting the way the enzyme binds. So the enzyme is sort of binding more strongly or weakly depending on whether it has the substrate bound. And of course, when it's substrate bound, that's when the catalysis can happen and that's when the binding is weakened and that's why the quantum yield is so low. Um, so now we're working on, uh, this is the um, a picture of the enzyme and it's positively charged pocket. And so now we're working on trying to make nanocrystals that can keep up with these structural conformation. And so that's when quantum dots come in um, because they're smaller and they can fit into that curved pocket there better. And we do see indeed that the electron transfer efficiency, this is Helena Keller, unpublished work, um, 
uh, not yet published, or, uh, where she sees that indeed the electron transfer efficiency depends very strongly on the quantum dot size, which may have to do with the binding as well as the driving force and, um, and so on. So that's what we're working on. But, but basically we're working on tuning the nanocrystals to, to work more synergistically with this enzyme and, and keep up with its structural changes during catalysis. All right, and in the remaining couple of minutes, I just want to, again, show you how the nitrogenase system is different um, and all this. So why does nitrogenase matter? So half of the nitrogen in our body comes from uh, nitrogenase. So Haber-Bosch process is the synthetic formation of fertilizer, but the other half uh, is from nitrogenases that are in legumes and, and such plants. And so what they do is they take nitrogen from the air uh, eight electrons and eight protons to make ammonia. So this is really crazy. And I'm not going to go into, because we're out of time, I'm not going to detail the structure of the enzyme and how it works. But I want to point out that what it does is, you know, it really needs a lot of electrons to do this. And so if the enzyme accumulates only two electrons, it can spit hydrogen back out or it can, uh, you know, reduce other substrate. But to actually get to ammonia, it needs to have up to uh, at least four electrons stored at its active site, four electrons and four protons. And that's when ammonia uh, nitrogen binds. And so, you know, the enzyme really needs a high flux of electrons. Otherwise, it can just go backwards. Um, and so what we did is um, in nature, this is the sort of electron flux is provided by something called an iron protein. And it requires ATP hydrolysis and so on. And so replaced all that by a chemical machinery with um, photoexcited nanorods would then inject electrons into the enzyme. And we do see, in fact, this is work of Kate Brown, um, that the at high excitation frequency, so at, at low excitation frequency, we see relatively little ammonia and more hydrogen because again, the enzyme is going backwards and spitting out the hydrogen. But when we increase excitation frequency, we see more ammonia and less hydrogen. And so this is telling us that it is that ability of nanocrystals to, to sustain high excitation rates um, that and deliver electrons fast to the enzyme that that gets it all the way to ammonia. Okay, it's very hard to get ammon uh, um, um, artificially to get get this enzyme to get to ammonia. Okay, um, so very quickly, um, you know, the binding. I, I won't deliver this because we're out of time, but you know, we're trying to understand the binding. It's different than hydrogenase. Um, but I do want to uh, say what we learned about the electron transfer kinetics and how it's different than the hydrogenase system. One thing we learned from all of our electron transfer TA and, and kinetic modeling, um, it really depends strongly on the nanorod structure. We did not see this with hydrogenase so much, but if the nanorods get too wide, uh, then we don't see any electron transfer. So it's kind of, it, it, the system is very selective to the um, so if you do want to do this reaction, talk to us about picking the right nanocrystals. It's very selective to size, which may have to do with driving force again. Um, and then the other thing is that, again, this enzyme does turn over all the electrons it gets, whether it makes ammonia or hydrogen. This um, depends on the excitation rate. But again, it's really good at storing and using these electrons. Um, and um, the binding is, is, is somewhat weak, so, so we need to work on that. Okay, my beeper is telling me to move on. Just want to say we're part of a, a, a team, and so there's a lot of EPR work on the nitrogenase and so on to understand some of the other aspects that you might have questions about. So just to summarize then, again, we've uh, talked about um, why it's important to understand population heterogeneity for quantitative understanding of electron transfer kinetics and then evolve this, you know, from simple to complex catalysis where in hydrogenase case, the enzyme just cares about, you know, sucking up electrons and turning them over. And then the carbon-carbon bond formation, the enzyme turns on and off electron transfer during catalysis and nitrogenase really needs a high electron flux. So with that, um, I'm, if, I don't know if we have time, sorry about that. Um, I will take questions if we can. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Wide variety of enzymes you work with too, that's, that's great. So I see a question from Elena Rajkova. Uh, uh, Giordano, thank you. Uh, great, great, amazing work. I have a, a question regarding nitrogenase. Uh, I think as far as I know, uh, the most important, uh, most like, uh, like important bottleneck in uh, hydrogenases I think you use uh, D-iron hydrogenase. Is, a, uh, um, 
extremely uh, extreme sensitivity to oxygen. So, Indeed. Um, yes, it's it's not it's not a, a big problem probably uh, to use um, uh, electro to get electron. Of course, photo uh, induced electrons are uh, free of charge. Yes, uh, but. Uh, oxygen sensitivity, and also uh, then you combine your nanorods um, with uh, with a protein. Again, there is another problem with oxygen because of in natural systems uh, electron transfer is very well balanced and coupled. And uh, uh, if if there is no uh, very tight uh, coupling between uh, uh, electron uh, source. And electron uh, and, uh, and enzyme or, or subunit of enzyme, uh, it could be escape of uh, electrons and reduction of oxygen to free radicals and damage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you uh, address these issues? So, I mean, you're right that the oxygen is a big deal, and we work in strictly anaerobic conditions. Um, there's hydrogenases that are less oxygen sensitive; they're also slower, mm -hmm. um, but you know it this and is it just the reality slow. sorry slower and more and it's reversible they are reversible iron nickel they actually catalyze both reactions yeah so do these as well so it's just that we're driving it forward with the electrons um and so you know we work in strictly anaerobic conditions and oh, yeah. in terms of um coupling everything strongly i i sort of Pulled under the, I shoved under the rug all the stuff about hole transfer and, and hole scavenging. So, you know, the source of electrons is this electron donor and solution, which varies from system to system, uh, because that's what replaces the holes in the nanocrystal. So in that sense, everything is coupled through the nanocrystal, which absorbs the light and delivers electrons and regenerates its electron. Would it be maybe more expensive, but would it be smart to try to, instead of electrostatic interaction, to modify uh, nanostructure, nano rods uh, with something uh, to, that recognize binding site of uh, yeah. toxin? Then yeah, yeah, we're exactly a uh, couple to the uh, right spot. Yeah, so that this is the, uh, so for hydrogenase, we don't have the, you know, in, all the electrons are getting delivered and all that. And so it's not as much of a problem, but with nitrogenase, there the issue is where is the nanocrystal binding? And we are thinking about how to direct it where it needs to go because there are a couple of different pathways for electrons that are equally probable. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to go into that, but yeah, we definitely are thinking about directed binding. It's just not easy. Very interesting one. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so in the interest of time, we have to uh, move on. So, so thank you very much again, Gordana. Uh, so, so up next, we have uh, Professor Tim Lian from Emory University. Uh, uh, thank you very much for also for, for taking the time today. Uh, he's gonna be talking to us about structure, oh, okay, the Tesla different in-situ probing of uh, structure and dynamics at metal electrode electrolyte interfaces by electrochemical surface enhanced selective vibrational spectroscopic methods. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Oh, at the moment. All right. Thank you. Can you can you see this okay? Yeah, we can see your slides, and I think we can see your cursor also. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, Rich, thanks for organizing this, and, and thanks for uh, uh, the invitation to uh, to join this list of uh, excellent talks. Uh, I wanted to tell you something. Uh, a really new line of research that my group has been engaged in for the past few years. Um, uh, I think Gordana probably have not heard this talk before. So, uh, so this had to do with probing um, really electrochemical interfaces. And I have three stories here I want to share with you. Uh, the middle one, I think I'm just going to mention it very, very briefly, uh, but focus on the, on the first and the last bit. All right, so when we think about electrochemical interface, this is the picture we have. Uh, you, typically, you have a solid electro and a, a, a liquid electrolyte. And the double layer is the sub-nanometer region between these two phases that really plays an important role that determines you know, what these devices do and how well they can do it. And I borrowed this um, beautiful cartoon from Adam Wheeler, uh, who hands-draw this. He's a part of my uh, MURI team. 
Um, so well, for a physical chemist, um, and really many of you in this audience, when we think about the, the double layer, the electrical double layer, you had this picture in your mind, you had this uh, one dimensional electrostatic potential that decays from the electro to the bulk solution, right? Uh, but in reality, of course, um, uh, this is what the electrochemical interface look, look more like this, and it is highly molecular. So, um, so this type of continuum sort of ensemble average type of model uh, really lacking molecular details. Um, uh, so the electrostatic potential really is a function of X, Y, Z as far as time. And so that aspect need to be uh, uh, considered if we really wanted to understand uh, its role fully. And, and this gets even worse when you think about reactions on the surface, you know, uh, like electrocatalysis, then how the molecule interact with the electro uh, plays an essential role. And, and so this is a type of uh, 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 interaction that's not really fully uh, captured in this simple electrostatic model. All right, so uh, a few years back, a group of us uh, 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 form a team and, and we are successfully uh, 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 get funded by this MURI uh, with a mission really to understand, to advance molecular level understanding of electrochemical interfaces. And this is a team of excellent experimentalists, theoreticians, real electrochemists, and we, 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 we came together and has been a lot of fun. Um, so in today's talk, I really gonna uh, wanted to just highlight a few things that, that we have been uh, participating in, uh, in, uh, in this project. So the first story um, has to do uh, with the electroinduction effect on molecular catalysts. So that is, if you're buying a catalyst on the surface, um, and the electro uh, really plays a really, really uh, interesting role on the property of catalyst. The second story had to do, to do with how we actually um, probed the atomistic structure of the double layer. And finally, and this is, uh, uh, has, last bit had to do with hot electron induced vibrational dynamics of molecules. And this is related to plasmonic hot carrier photocatalysis. Okay, so the first paper, first uh, uh, story is a, is a long-standing collaboration uh, also funded by Air Force between my group and Clip QBS group at San Diego and Victor Batista's group at Yale. And so this project continued from our initial grant uh, into this uh, MURI project. And this is really based on uh, two uh, papers that we published recently. And this is a whole, all this had to do was attaching molecular catalysts on electro surface. And this has been a, a really emerging and it's getting to be more and more popular a way of doing catalysis, both electrocatalysis and photocatalysis. And the idea is very simple in the sense that you want to combine the, the really best property of molecular catalyst and photoelectro and molecular catalyst by far as best known uh, catalyst in terms of how it work. And one could argue it can be uh, rationally improved and optimized. And electro, of course, still by far the best material for absorbing light for moving charges. And so in fact, uh, uh, I'm a member of this Chase, the DOE funded liquid solar fuels hub. Uh, its whole mission is to come up with this type of hybrid uh, uh, catalyst to do to convert CO2 into liquid fuel. And there we've been focusing on attaching various molecular catalysts on silicon electro. This sounds like simple and uh, obvious idea, but in fact, it's a lot more complicated. And this has to do with the fact that we know very little about how uh, the electro impacts the function of catalysts. Uh, in fact, uh, even trivial uh, questions such as how the catalyst, what's the binding geometry of the catalyst on the surface? That's often not known. Uh, and more importantly, how catalysts interact with the electro, that is electronic interaction uh, between these entities sometimes can be very profound. And finally, the, the, the interfacial environment, uh, the catalyst in is very different from the environment that invokes solutions. So often most of these molecular catalysts are designed 
and optimized and understood in bulk solution. Now you certainly put them on an interface, it will experience very different uh, uh, micro environment that had to be uh, uh, understood too. Okay, so the first experiment we did uh, or, or the system we have focused on uh, really is this Renian tricarbonyl by purity catalyst. And Eclipse Group has worked on this for many years. And this is the one of the best study CO2 reduction catalyst. Uh, uh, our initial, uh, uh, and so we like this too, uh, mostly because there are three very strong CO stretching bands on that on the Renian Center that offers a very nice uh, spectroscopic probe of what the catalyst is doing. And so on the right here, I show you a CV just to show you this in solution now. And this is a real CO2 reduction catalyst. Okay. So in this experiment, uh, oh, so we, so the way my group, we're gonna probe this. So in this experiment, we just simply put this catalyst on the electrode surface as indicated. Uh, in this cartoon here, and really ask the, ask the question of, as we change the bias, uh, what happened to the catalyst? Uh, our original intent was, of course, to do CO2 reduction, uh, but as I will show you, uh, uh, in, we didn't get there, but in, in the process, we actually learned something quite interesting. And so the way we probe it is to use SFG, uh, that's the vibration of some frequency generation, I had to mention now through MURI uh, project, we had actually been developing multiple uh, um, ways to look at molecular catalysts on surface. But in this particular study, we're gonna use some frequency generation spectroscopy. And in the next second project, we'll mention uh, surface enhanced Rama. That's another way one could do it. So in, the, in some frequency generation spectroscopy, we bring an IR photon and a visible photon. Uh, so in this case, IR is broadband, visible narrow band, and they interact with the molecule and the surface and generate a third, uh, 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 generate a new um, a field at the sum of these two frequencies. And that's why this is called some frequency generation. And so, so maybe the picture on the right is a better way to think about it. Basically, IR photon excite the vibration uh, and we generate polarization and that polarization is further uh, interact with visible light now, generate a, a polarization that emits of these frequencies. And without going to any details, basically, whenever the IR frequency is in resonance with the vibrational transition, this signal is enhanced. And so effectively, you have a way to measure the, uh, the vibrational spectral molecule on surface. And being a, uh, being a nonlinear technique, this, this some frequency signal has zero background. So therefore it's a very sensitive way. And so you can measure uh, sub monolayer molecules on surface. So here's the uh, experimental scheme. Uh, uh, and so we say we, all we did was put in on a, uh, a, a uh, and this catalyst immobilized on a gold electrode. And then we basically make a simple electrochemical cell. Uh, and then we bring ion invisible beam hitting the electrode and then measure SFG in the process. And we can just change the potential that applied to the gold electrode. So on the right here, it's a, a cycle of a tamagran of this system. So starting from, you know, uh, let's say plus 0.2 volt, if you scan to more negative potential, you actually see a small, uh, to the most part, you see nothing here. So that means there's not much redox chemistry going on, but at about minus 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volt, you see a little wave. And that turns out to be the desorption of the molecule. It's a breaking of the gold thiol bond. And if you keep on going now, you start to see catalytic current. And this is the, this is the hydrogen evolution in this case. Okay? And, but if you don't go too far, you actually scan back. And interestingly, this molecule actually reattach. And then uh, you can scan back, deposit it. You can do this back and forth. Okay? So in our experiment, we basically try to focus on this narrow spectrum uh, a potential region so that we can do this experiment repeatedly. So here's a set of um, uh, S of G spectra uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a function of potential. On the left here is a pseudo color plot. Here's a wave number and then here's a potential and the, and the intensity of peak shows that in colors. On the right is, is basically the same data now um, plotted in a 2D way. 
Um, so none of them is very clear, but if you pull one of these spectra and they will look something like this, and I will, and I will uh, uh, look into, uh, into it closely uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But these type of spectra basically contains uh, three sets of information. One is a peak intensity, right? So these peak intensity tell you about orientation of the molecule. The second has to do with a peak position. As you can see, this peak position indicated by this red line here and the white line here change with potential. And they actually tell you about the electric field strength the molecule is experiencing. And finally, even you move away from that uh, CO stretch, you still see signals. And that turns out to be the signal of the goal and the, and the double layer. But let me start out with the, uh, the sort of non-resonant background. And so what, what I've been uh, uh, mentioning earlier had to do with the resonant response of molecule. That's a CO stretching mode. But of course, gold surface also have SFG signal and the electric double layer always have SFG signal too, okay? And so, so in fact, if you scan this, uh, 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 if you go away from a the resonant, then you're really just looking at this, uh, this, this bit here. And in fact, the signal actually interestingly going through, if you just plot the amplitude actually going through minimum at about minus 0.2 volt. And that turns out to be uh, 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 close to the po potential zero charge of this uh, electrode. So that's where the potential is zero between the electrode and the, and the liquid. And that's why the signal going through a minimum. And but you can verify that by electrochemical measurement. So the SFG actually offers a very simple way uh, to measure this, uh, the potential zero charge, which is an important property of, of electrochemical system. Right? Uh, the second information is more interesting to us for this study is the relative peak intensity. So I show you here two sets of uh, two curves. One, the open symbol is experimentally measured spectrum and the blue curve is a computed SFG spectrum that correspond to this geometry, okay? And so, so it's through this type of uh, comparing, comparing experiment and computation and we can get out the orientation of the molecule. And so basically this, this CO stretching intensity, uh, these are three CO normal modes that are basically orthogonal to each other. And so there, so in this measurement, we essentially measure the projection on a Z axis. So there's a very unique way. And so there's a very unique orientation for each of the relative intensity pattern that you measure, okay? Well, the signal goes a little bit funky in the sense go up and down. That has to do, they are, these molecular response interfere with the very, with the broad, uniform uh, response of goal, and that give you this plus and minus signs in this type of uh, signal. But the main point is that SFG is a, is a quite powerful way to determine catalyst orientation on the electrical surface. And so we're now using it to look at catalysts on semiconductor surface in our work with Chase. And the last piece of information has to do with the peak position. And so, so which is shown here, uh, now, as you can see, when you start to go potential from about plus zero to minus one, you start to see uh, this, the, the, the frequency moves linearly uh, with potential, okay? And this is very well known as the vibrational star effect, okay? And so basically in a simplest way to think about this is the V equals zero and V equal one level of the CO stretching mode have different uh, dipole moments. So in the plasma electric field, and they move by different amount. And so therefore the frequency difference or the frequency of CO stretching mode, and which is the energy difference between this level will change with the applied electric field, okay? So, um, so, so from this relationship, you could see we measure this frequency. And, and if we know um, the, this dipole moment difference, this is also called a stock tuning rate of molecule. And then we could actually measure electric field strength. And so this is, this is one of the things we did. And so a Victor's group just take this type of optimized geometry of molecule on the electrical surface, and then they just apply uniform electric field. Uh, and then they calculate how the dipole, how the frequency changes field. From there, they can compute what this delta mu is, okay? And then with that information, we can convert our measured uh, frequency to an electric field. 
and we get our amplitude on the order of one volt per nanometer. And that actually agrees reasonably well with what you expect from a, you know, a continuum type of uh, uh, model for the double layer. And so, so, so one will get a picture look something like this. Uh, right? So this molecule actually, we believe sits well within the double layer and that's why it's experiencing a large electric field. One uh, interesting thing about this uh, measurement, uh, uh, this is this this down to us uh, after our uh, published our initial paper is that this this change of CO frequency is very large. Over the one volt uh, potential that we tune, this changed by twenty five way number. Okay, and so if you're inorganic chemists, when they look at this frequency, they basically will say the charge density on the metal, on the rhenium, changed very significantly. In fact, uh, uh, for people like Cliff, if they want to tune the catalyst, one of the things they would do is to change the different substituent groups on the bipyridine. And from that, they can change the charge density on the rhenium center and move its frequency, CO of CO, and also change the CO2 reduction activity. Uh, in fact, they had to work very hard. So here's a list of... Uh, uh, a range of CO frequencies, uh, a range of substituent they can add uh, with Hammett parameter essentially uh, really sample the, the available or at least easily available range of electron withdrawing and donating ability. All they can manage is five-way number chain in the CO frequency. So this is basically saying that uh, the electro can, can, can induce a much bigger effect on the charge density on the rhenium than what you can achieve with a substituent. And so this gives us this uh, idea of using this electro as a way to tune catalytic uh, activity. So this is the uh, so-called electro induction in fact. So we're still uh, working on this preactively. In fact, we recently show uh, using the same effect, you could actually uh, do reversible hydrogen bonding between species and solution and the electro, for example, all through tuning the charge density on the molecular species that's attached. I think I don't have time, so I'm going to skip over uh, this a little bit. This basically had to do with the question, how far can you extend this out to the electro? We think we might be a little bit lucky in this case because the molecule leans very closely and is attached uh, you know, through this covalent linkage. And so the question is, how far can you extend this out? And so CLIPS group actually designed a molecule. This looks like more realistic way of attachment. And so you have this uh, uh, isocyanide, benzene diisocyanide as a group attached to the surface. And then you can modulate putting any transition metal center here. And so, and so these, these species is actually almost, uh, this, this metal center is about one, 0.2 nanometer away from the electro, and we still see substantial uh, uh, electro uh, sort of uh, uh, if uh, electro induction in fact on the metal center. So we're very excited about that. I'll skip over that. So in the second piece, um, I, I just really want to mention. So so what I show you a way to look at a draw molecule catalyst by some preconsideration. We all right, we can also do that by Raman spectroscopy too. But what we have not talk about is what, what is surrounding the catalyst and what is the solvent is doing, what the electrolyte doing. And that turns out to be more difficult for SFG because FCG requires light coming in, at least in this experiment from the solvent side. So anything that's already in solution gonna absorb all the light. And so this is where surface enhanced Raman become very, very useful. So, so in this project, uh, we actually uh, uh, basically uh, form a, a deposit, a, plasmonic nanoparticle on a single crystal go electro. And this particle is oxide protected. So we believe that it should not interfere with the electrochemistry. But, what, we, uh, but what, it, what it does is form a little gap mode between the particle and the electro. And, and so now the molecule that in between this, it's gap uh, uh, enhanced and you can get very nice Raman spectrum. So we can use that actually to measure the spectrum of water molecule and the electrolyte actually, that's, that's, that's in between those two. And this is a collaborative project between my group and Tito's group at Cornell. 
and uh, uh, Professor uh, Fan's group at uh, uh, Huazong University of Science and Technology in China. Um, I won't go into any detail at all, but just to show you that one, we can measure the Raman spectrum of water, and then we can, we can use that to benchmark MD simulation. Uh, and from that, we can start to piece together a molecular level picture of what the electrolytes are doing, what the water is doing uh, uh, and as a function of potential. Okay, I, I really just wanted to use the remaining time to talk about the last bit, which has to do with how electron induced vibration dynamic the CO and go. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to make a point, right? So we- We, we also we, started like three minutes into your time. So, so please feel free to go, uh, like you, you probably have six minutes with questions included still. So. Okay, yeah, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna stick it through this, this. I do need to make a message quickly. Okay, so we all know, uh, 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 most of you know, know plasma. This is basically a coherent oscillation right, of electrons. But one thing you, we probably haven't thought a lot about is the plasma actually decays very, very rapidly. Okay, and in fact, plasma lives only for 10 femtosecond-ish. And it quickly decays. So when it decays, it will make hot electron holes in the, um, in the metal. And so this is where, and this is where typically understood by this two temperature model. So initially you make very hot electrons and the electron reach its thermal distribution. So the electron temperature rise instantaneously is essentially on the you know, tens of femtosecond time scale. Uh, and then uh, electron uh, cools, it cools by coupling with phonons. Okay, uh, so, so our interest, and this is the interest of plasma hot carrier photocatalysis field, is to use this hot electron hole to do chemistry. All right, and so what is really interesting in, in, in this scenario is if you now put a molecule on the surface on this, of this, plas on this plasmonic metal, and of course the, under uh, certain conditions, this hot electron could transfer into the molecule, okay? And, and, and this happens, of course, you will now to start to initiate um, um, the uh, a chemistry with the molecule. And so this, the effect of how molecules interact with the plasma is, uh, has also been uh, uh, proposed and it's also understood through this, I would call this a three temperature model now. So now in, in addition to the electron temperature, the phonon temperature, now you have adsorbate temperature, right? So you can imagine two scenarios uh, how the how the molecule uh, temperature can rise. One, of course, is through direct coupling with the electron. And so this is where the interesting part because the electron temperature can be very high. Or if this coupling is not weak, it's not strong enough, then the electron will relax to phonon and the phonon can still heat up the molecule, but now to a much lesser extent. So the first scenario, uh, the way people think about it, this is actually through very rapid electron transfer from the metal into the adsorbate, make an anion transiently. And this anion, of course, will decay because there's all this empty orbital in the metal, the electron want to return. But as a result of that, uh, when the anion decays back to neutral ground state, it typically gonna end up at a different nuclear displacement. Therefore, it excites the vibration of the molecule. And so, so this is often called a hot electron pathway. Uh, of course, if, as I said, if this is not fast enough, then the phonon get heated in the metal and that phonon can transfer energy to the CO. And so what we've been interested in, so this type of picture has been invoked in the gas phase or uh, really photoelectrochemistry community. So we've been thinking about to what extent this type of picture still apply in under electrochemical conditions, or can we use electrochemistry to enhance this photocatalysis? Uh, and it would do this by time result S of G measurement. And so, um, so basically I show you S of G measurement before, now we just need to add a pump beam and then we can just measure difference of S of G signal. And so here's the S of G spectrum. Uh, this is a CO stretching mode. It looked a little bit uh, strange and that had to do again with the fact that we have the resonant response of CO that interfere with the goal response and this gives you this. So this is all well understood and can be, can be pulled out. But here's, here's the main result. This is the transient uh, uh, SFG difference spectrum. 
So this is an after extension minus before extension and at the CO stretching mode. And so you really ma mainly see this, the shifting of the CO uh, stretching mode frequency to the red. And that uh, right away, you know, is because the molecule is vibrationally excited. And so uh, through unharmonic coupling of various CO stretching modes, okay, it doesn't have to be CO stretching itself, but any of these modes, they all unharmonic couple to the CO stretch. So when any of these modes get excited, the frequency of CO stretch will shift, okay? Um, and so, so I, I'm really running out of time, but the main message I just want to say is, uh, is that we, we, we started with, with a very simple fitting, essentially ask how much of the molecule is excited, okay? And so, and, and from that fitting, we basically pull out this parameter of, uh, of the, uh, the percentage of excited molecule as function time. But the main message is that this writes essentially instantaneously, okay? And so if, if I were to compare this cartoon of how the electron temperature change, and you will notice that this basically agrees with electron temperature. And so this, and this, this very preliminary analysis is already telling us that in this system, we know that the CO is heated up through this electron, hot electron pathway. There's, that the excitation of the metal generate high electron that transfer the CO very rapidly and that leads to vibrational excitation, okay? So we know this is very preliminary. So we, have been, we are now actually in the process of uh, 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 analyzing in a much more sophisticated way. And that, that's a, that sophisticated way is to know the inharmonicity of all these modes and, and essentially how they couple to the CO stretch. And then you can give it each mode a vibrational temperature and then, and then really then start to pull out which mode is, is, is selectively excited. So in the, in the middle of, of doing that. All right, let me, let me just wrap up here. So I hope I have uh, 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 shown you that one could, why we could use uh, some frequency generation to look at catalysts on electrical surface that we observed this very interesting electrical induction effect. And I didn't really have time to tell you about how we could, how we could use surface enhanced Raman uh, to really put uh, and combine with MD simulation to really get a, a atomistic uh, level picture of the double layer. And finally, in the last bit, uh, I, show, I show you that using time result SFG, we can um, probe how hot electron generated metal can couple with vibration of the molecule. And with that, I should end and thank you for your attention. Right, great. Thanks very much, Professor Leon. Wonderful talk. Um, we have time for one quick question if, if someone would like to. And I see uh, Gordana's hand up, I think, a clapping in hand up. Mm. Uh, great talk, Tim. Thank you. I had a question about um, you know, you showed the small, uh, the experiments give you the uh, molecular orientation. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering how much do you know about the distribution? Like, are all the molecules that way? How much fluctuation is there? Um, you know, are you looking at some kind of an average or that kind of thing? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so in this particular experiment, we, we did not, um, uh, so, so, so good. So this is a, this is not a, so we assume a geometry and then compute this. And so, so this type of model actually worked reasonably well for molecule on a oxide surface, for example, where they actually bind very strongly. And so there's a, there you, we, from, from the DFT calculation, we know there's actually unique geometry. On this metal, uh, to what extent that works, um, not clear, because it turns out this, this potential here is relatively shallow. That is, uh, there's not really truly a very unique minimum. And so there, this average picture probably uh, would, be, would be better. Right, and so, um, so, so we haven't really analyzed that in detail. And also this dynamic, that's a really even more interesting question, right? How even the orientation change or even really if surrounding environment change that will also give you uh, a range of frequencies and range of intensity patterns. So that is something that we are actually uh, uh, designing experiment to do that requires some kind of 2D SFG type of measurement. 
And that's something that's very, very interesting to us. And we are working pretty hard towards that. Thanks. Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much. And again, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on to our, our last speaker of the afternoon. Uh, and thanks again, Tim, for the presentation. Wonderful. Um, so up next, we have our own Ben DeRoll from Argonne National Lab. Uh, he'll be talking about spectroscopic measurements of heat transfer at organic and organic nano uh, nanoscale interfaces. Who's Ben? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully you can see it and hear me. Yep. We can uh, see your slides. We can see your cursor. All right. Great. Uh, so yeah, as Rich mentioned, I'll be talking, as my title suggests, about um, spectroscopic measurements of heat transfer. Uh, so uh, a little bit more related to what Aaron presented earlier in in some sense, um, there's a lot of ultrafast spectroscopy is mostly concerned with uh, excitation across band gaps. Um, and this is um, primarily concerned with uh, vibrational excitation. Um, so some motivation, at least within the field of nanoparticles, but also more generally is that you know, heat is generally, uh, or most often is kind of a negative effect on performance. So usually uh, makes emission properties worse, um, both in terms of intensity and in bandwidth, um, just through electron phonon coupling effects. Detectors have to be cooled typically. Um, you get uh, roll off effects in LEDs or, or similar kinds of effects from lasers. And the most common reason, or the most generic reason, is just um, relatively uh, uh, poor thermal transport, means that those materials can heat up quite a bit and then they start quenching uh, emission or, or generating non radiative um, pathways for recombination. Uh, so, so it, I would say this is a problem in almost all materials, and it's, it's even maybe worse in nanoparticles in some respects because, uh, in at least in solid state, they tend to have pretty poor thermal transport. So there's Ben. I wonder, can you move a little closer to your microphone? The the connection, a couple words here and there will will not come through. Okay, so I hope it's better, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we can hear rather okay. well. It might be a little bit better if you're close to your microphone. Okay. Um, so then I'll also note here, there's a few examples of uh, the existing approaches that have been taken to study thermal properties in nanoparticle systems. Uh, on the left is a pump probe. I think it's the picosecond, nanosecond transient absorption of metal particles. And this works pretty well because you can directly excite uh, the, the intraband or interband transitions in metal nanoparticles and it pretty quickly becomes a hot particle. Uh, so most of the electronic effects are kind of gone relatively rapidly. So you can fairly readily isolate that you're just looking at a thermal process. Um, and then you can do some modeling to determine say, what is the how how fast can these particles that are hot cool down in various environments and sort of thing. In the middle is an example from uh, John Mallon and uh, Dimitri Talapin, where they're looking at thermal conductivity of nanoparticle solids, and this is kind of the basis for my assertion that it's not very good. Uh, and they found that. They can change the core size, they can change ligand to some extent, they can change the composition of a nanoparticle. And uh, using these uh, frequency domain thermal reflectance measurements, and I think time domain thermal reflectance has sort of reached a similar conclusion. You basically are sitting in a range of thermal conductivity that, uh, if you look this up on sort of standardized tables, this covers sort of different kinds of wood or somewhere in that range. Um, is uh, 0.1 to 0.4 or so uh, in watts per meter Kelvin. And then uh, the last one I'll show is um, some work from Aaron, actually, and uh, a colleague of, of ours here now at uh, Argonne, uh, Burak Gesselberg. And um, this is using uh, electron diffraction in the time domain to look at, um, in this particular figure, various diffraction peaks. 
but you can study then uh, in a say somewhat more direct way the changes in the lattice as a function of uh, optical excitation. And so you can extract from that also some information about uh, thermal conductance of say the solid sample that you're looking at, but you also might be able to look at anisotropy in that phenomenon. And you can also isolate, um, whereas say the middle figure is looking at kind of the net aggregate, and you often have to resort to molecular dynamics or effective media to extract which surfaces are important. You can maybe start to infer something like that from these um, high time resolution techniques as well. Uh, so what I'm talking about is not any of those. Uh, it's um, transient absorption spectroscopy, um, marginally changed uh, here to use different excitation energies. Um, and um, it's really concerned in their particular case at the interface between organic ligands that are on a particle, a nanoparticle surface, uh, and the inorganic core of that particle, as well as in some cases, the solvent that can surround them, but you can also do this measurement in the solid state. And the basic idea is that if you look at absorption spectrum of a nanoparticle system that's synthesized in a nonpolar organic solvent, so that would be the most common ones used for things like um, lasers or LEDs that people make in research and, and you know, maybe translate into actual applications. Uh, so something like cadmium selenide here will have fairly nice uh, quantum confined absorption peaks in the visible, and it will also have uh, absorption peaks in the infrared from these decorating ligands. And we'll say the relative ratio of these peaks is gonna depend on the particle size primarily, but you can also uh, modulate to some extent the density of coating or the nature of that coating. So this is just coated with oleic acid, uh, but of course you can do ligand exchanges and things like that and vary the infrared spectrum fairly substantially. A pretty important thing to you know, remember um, in, in the case of cadmium selenide at least, is that it's essentially transparent from wherever the visible band gap is to uh, several tens of microns. And so um, what we're doing here is we're using an infrared photon uh, from uh, our femtosecond laser through an OPA. So this one is centered around 34, 3500 nanometers. And you can see it's quite broad spectrally because of um, uncertainty burden. Um, and we're going to try to excite these vibrational um, resonances of the uh, organic ligand. So uh, if you're real familiar, you'll know that the ones at three and a half microns are related to CH stretches. Okay, so then um, just for the basic idea is that if you have one infrared photon and all the energy goes to heat the particle, for a given, for the particles we're using here, a given size, um, a couple few nanometers in diameter, you can reasonably expect that, that amount of energy could at least in principle heat up a particle by a few Kelvin. And um, what we are able to calculate or at least estimate based upon these cross sections and the intensity of, of the laser and the spectral overlap is that we have something like 2% of the ligands are excited. And so if you have a particle that has something like 50 to 200 Ligands, you're exciting somewhere between one and five, well, zero and five of those ligands uh, in a Poisson distribution, most likely. Okay, so that's kind of how we start. Um, and then what do we actually measure? Uh, that's the electronic probe part of this. Uh, and so we can extract a, a change in temperature just by using the calibrated changes in the band gap with temperature of the nanoparticle. So uh, if you say take a sample of cadmium selenide as it did here and you change the temperature by pretty small steps, you'll see typically a linear response uh, in the absolute change of absorbance versus the absolute change in temperature. And then if you're doing the experiment that I described here, where you do an infrared uh, 
excitation, and then you probe the change in band gap using visible photons, which is say like vanilla transient absorption, you will see that, well, they match actually quite well in terms of the spectral features. And so you can uh, potentially use static uh, measurements to give you a calibrated uh, temperature to extract from spectral changes. Uh, and then, of course, you're doing this in a transient absorption setup, so you can optically delay your probe beam uh, and extract kinetic information. And so what does that look like in a two-dimensional sense uh, is shown on the left here. Uh, so you uh, initially, you're uh, exciting the particles, as I'm sort of showing cartoonishly on the right, with an infrared pump. You excite the ligand vibration. We think that intramolecular vibrational relaxation is occurring rather quickly because all of the evidence of, of that in, in condensed phase is that it's very rapid. And then, so you have a, a ligand that initially has a very excited pH vibration, but then um, fairly quickly, you just have a, a hot oleic acid. And then um, we see over time that depends to some extent on the ambient temperature or, or the sample condition. Uh, but in the range of, we'll say, 10 to 30 picoseconds, you see a change in the band gap of the inorganic core. And that's sort of this middle cartoon on the right, where you say ligand to core heat transfer. And then if you keep watching, you'll actually start to see equilibration with the solvent environment and what we think is transfer out to the solvent. Uh, so uh, what does this look like in a two-dimensional map? On the left, you see uh, a bathochromic shift in the band gap. So you get a little bit more absorption on the red side and a little bit less on the blue side of the, at the first exotonic peak. And uh, first you get that and it increases a bit and then around 30 picoseconds or so, we actually start seeing it cooling down. And, and the exact competition of the, the rising and falling depends on the, uh, the sample and the solvent um, and probably on some other conditions which I'll get into. Okay, so this is experimentally what's going on. You probably notice at the sort of early time delays in these, this map, there's kind of all sorts of coloration. Um, so I'll just briefly say as an aside that, you know, when you excite these samples with um, infrared pulses that are well beneath the band gap, you also will generate uh, Kerr effects in the solvents, especially. And uh, you'll also generate pretty, in fact, quite strong um, AC optical Stark effect. So this, this is, in fact, cut in such a way that you can't really see it uh, because it would overwhelm the signal. Um, but really, these are, um, if you, you know, carefully measure them, they're essentially present and gone with the laser pulse. And then, you know, an order of magnitude later, you start seeing substantial changes in the band gap that are associated with heating. Um, okay, so um, what kind of variables can you look at if this experiment works? Uh, initially, we started looking at maybe obvious suspects like, well, how does it change with temperature? And in fact, this transfer times tend to slow down with temperature, which is generally what you expect. Um, how does it change with fluent? And um, this is in part related to the estimate we have for um, approximately how much of the, the ligands are excited. And that, well, over our range of fluent, uh, we don't really see anything but approximately a linear change in the temperature rise that you can estimate. And also probably no real change in the uh, rise time for this particular sample. Uh, so we're probably not in a regime where we're getting um, so many excitations per uh, per particle uh, that we would see any kind of interaction or something beyond the linear addition. Another straightforward, or at least in principle straightforward thing that we looked at in this study are uh, if we change the solvent environment. Um, and so one important note is 
you can't just do this in a typical hydrogenated solvent. Uh, they have a lot of absorption right here where are all these CH stretches are. So you need to do this in a um, at least a deuterated solvent if they're hydrocarbons, or you would need to do this in some kind of infrared transparent solvent, at least infrared transparent at the pump wavelength. And so uh, you'll note they're they're all deuterated if they're typical hydro, um, hydrocarbons. Um, but what you can see in this case is the sort of rise and fall of temperature. And in this case, it's delta A, it's essentially linear related to temperature for all the samples. And there are some subtle effects here. Um, you know, the rise time, if you fit as an exponential, is not really sensitive to the solvent. And that maybe should be. Um, what you would expect because uh, the solvent probably doesn't affect the uh, ligand binding onto the particle itself, although it might affect ligand conformation uh, if you imagine something that's a better solvent or a poorer solvent. Uh, but you do see that if you look at, say, the heat outflow time, that you can actually see some changes. Um, we'll say a factor of two or so in terms of um, how long it takes for the cooling process to happen in these samples. So uh, say a good solvent, say one where you might expect the ligands to be well extended into the solvent rather than aggregated, tended to have faster decay time um, than poorer solvents. Uh, it's also possible, though not really certain, that that you could just be seeing some effects from the aggregation in the sample. Because if you're looking at the solid film of nanoparticles and doing this measurement, you see a rise uh, due to heating, but then over the kind of time scale that we're looking at here, essentially no decay. Uh, and this is, this is only really two nanoseconds. Or so. And then um, moving on, we sort of uh, brought this the set of data to a more sophisticated uh, thermal transport uh, folks uh, to do a little bit better modeling. And so this is a numerical model using an ANSYS uh, model back from uh, Carnegie Mellon and the group of John Mellon with his uh, student Yuxing. Um, and they showed if you say locally build uh, an excitation into this particle that has a, a organic, uh, oh, so we'll just say it's a layer of other material around it. It's not uh, molecular specific. And then a solvent of a different medium, and you can uh, have it evolve to fit experimental data. And you see you know, uh, initially you spread uh, around the, the particle, so you get heat transfer among the ligands and into the particle. And then eventually you get heat transfer out into the solvent. And so the, the system just evolves numerically to fit experimental data, uh, but it also kind of um, justifies a simplified model, which they also developed, where you can uh, think of this problem using uh, some coupled equations. And you really are interested in two things here, um, because we kind of experimentally, we, we have a pretty good idea of the temperature of the particle. We have a pretty good idea of the temperature of the environment. Uh, being ambient and then measured, um, expect, uh, but um, what we don't, what we want to extract from this is some kind of interfacial thermal conductances, and so um, using this model, you can extract these interfacial thermal conductances. Uh, it turns out that there's kind of some more complications to this, and that there's sort of local and global minima, um, and only one of them makes a lot of sense, but um, you can then take um, more than one scan. I mean, obviously, it's for like uh, 20 samples or something here, where we took different particles of different sizes and also uh, different graph densities of ligands. So you can wash the same batch of particles different numbers of times or with different solvents to generate variability in the graph density. And um, you generate then with some. Uh, library of samples and do these measurements. And what they can found is that, well, the graph density um, doesn't uh, really affect this um, 
nanocrystal to ligand interfacial thermal conducting, essentially flat. But the graph density is uh, proportionally related to the um, thermal conductance at the ligand to solvent chemistry. And so um, essentially what the thinking is, is that um, there's some kind of um, heat flow from ligands to particles is probably uh, occurring mainly through, say, good bonds or strong bonds. And you can think of that maybe as bidentate bonds. It's not necessarily that case. It could just be um, ligands that are particularly well aligned with the, the lattice in such a manner. Um, but then that the thermal outflow um, uh, is sort of mediated by this ligand density. Uh, or, or the degree of interaction between the ligands and, and also the solvent. Okay, so then um, that's kind of uh, some recent work that's sort of in the process of being published now. Uh, some other curiosities we found in doing this work is that if you go to low temperature, and I even subsequently found high temperature, and you're looking at solid films, you can actually launch uh, acoustic phonons in these materials. So this is a uh, lamellar uh, platelet. So the cadmium selenide platelets that form long stacks of say hundreds of particles. And um, you can of course verify that using a small angle X-ray scattering or DEM type measurements. But uh, what you saw, or what I saw rather is um, that in addition to say gross changes in the particle in uh, temperature with temperature, but you also see oscillatory changes that sort of ride on top of this. That's why I have this kind of residual written in here. Um, they're not small. They um, are, um, say, like 30% of the signal at low temperature. Um, but um, you do see, uh, in particular, that they uh, vary in frequency as a function of temperature and also to some extent intensity where you get say something that um, is vibrating at about 1.7 gigahertz and then it drops below a gigahertz above room temperature. Uh, and the thinking in this case is that what we're seeing is a uh, coherent acoustic vibration of these stacks of particles. And this is extremely low frequency. So if you're thinking in terms of energy, this is like microelectron volts. Um, it's far below the energy of acoustic phonons within a particle at least any reported examples of that. Um, it's even well below a lot of the simulated or measured um, energies of uh, acoustic vibration using, say, inelastic neutron scale. Uh, and so this is kind of telling us that uh, as you increase the temperature, you get a drop in this frequency, you're getting a softening of the spring, if you think of this in a hook fly uh, or you know, the ligand to become softer, the vibrational um, period elongates uh, to even lower frequency. Okay. Uh, another a curiosity um, we found in this is that if you're measuring something like uh, inorganic versus organic nanoparticle lattices, you actually see this prolonged non-equilibrium um, in the hybrid perovskite. Uh, it's something that's also found within uh, MAPBI or, or methyl ammonium lead iodide using the same technique by uh, Hei Jun Guo, who was also working at Argon at the time. So I would direct you to those figures if you're interested. And the thinking here is, of course, then we see that um, essentially all the thermal transport across the, the organic inorganic interface or that say ligand to nanoparticle interface is mediated by acoustic phonons. And there's a very long equilibration between acoustic phonons uh, of the hybrid perovskite with the, um, the much higher energy uh, organic vibrational um, modes that you also have in the particles. When you do this by say, when you sort of simulate this using molecular dynamics, you can see kind of all the energy is out of the ligand within let's say 10 picoseconds. The time scales here are a little bit faster than experimental observation by like a factor of three. Uh, but most of that energy is dumped directly into lead and bromine vibrational motion. And then only about an order of magnitude uh, later into form amandinium 
my brief. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, you can actually use this phenomenon in um, the kind of pump push probe technique, where if uh, for those who are familiar with cadmium selenide and, and most other semiconductors, if you look at them at very low temperatures, you will typically have uh, photoluminescence discovered by a dark space. And so they typically will have uh, some burst of emission when you initially excite them, because you often excite them with a little bit more energy than the band gap. Uh, but then it uh, becomes a very slow uh, radiation of photons because it's stuck in some dark space. Uh, or a, you can think of this as a triple. Uh, and so what we found is that if we, um, you know, initially excite, we you get this first, and then we have a slow emission. And this is not quite as slow as what's reported in uh, in worksite cadmium selenide. These are zinc blend particles, um, but the same generic picture holds. But then if you have an infrared photon or infrared photons that you use to say thermally excite the sample, you can actually generate a secondary burst of emission at some controlled time delay. So essentially what you're doing is you're uh, thermally flipping the spin from a triplet to a single bright state. Um, and then it releases phonons and you, uh, you're back into your triplet state again. Uh, okay, so conclusions um, from this is that you can do, it actually works to do resonant vibrational excitation and you can study uh, thermal transport that isolates the nanoparticle ligand and nanoparticle solvent interfaces uh, in a way that's not really readily doable, at least in semiconductor systems. And that you can study this as a, in solid films or solutions, you can study or, or ascertain that some, some solutions are say better for thermal tra uh, transport out of particles um, and that you can drive non-equilibrium effects by relatively small changes in temperature. Okay, I'll stop there and take questions if people have them. Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much, Ben. Much appreciated. Great talk. Um, do folks have questions? So, I mean, I guess some thoughts also back to the that picture of when Malin and Talapin uh, evaluated thermal transport properties in the static domain, you know, are we evolving toward a picture where that seems, or I guess we're just at the interface, not, not considering particle to particle transport. You, know, you didn't highlight as much, but I know there's data where we can see the recovery is different when it's in films versus in solution form. Um, so do you feel that those time domain measurements are consistent with these this graph in the middle? Well, yeah, I think we have like kind of too limited a picture using this mm -hmm. DA technique, right? Mm -hmm. That um, the kinds of bulk thermal conductivities that exist in um, in these reports from from Calvin or um, or I think there's some other reports that maybe show a little bit higher thermal conductivities recently, but, but still we're talking about no more than a factor of 10. Um, they all still point to fairly large barriers at various interfaces. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so I guess one way is to take data like we've collected and then use that as an input for molecular dynamics and then try to build out a bulk solid from that. Uh, and then the other way people have done this, which, which John, has also been, John Mallon has also been, is um, take the bulk data and then try to construct sorry, a local microscopic model that will tell you which interfaces are, are the most troubled. Um, I am kind of skeptical that we have enough time delay to actually see really meaningful differences in the solid state um, unless we see much larger changes than apparent in these samples. Um, I think that the difference in the thermal conductivities here implies that there's some really slow diffusion processes that are probably not escaping the probe spot on any time scale we can access, if I were to guess. Right. Okay. 
Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, if not, uh, thanks again, Ben, for the presentation. Um, you know, thanks to all the speakers we've had in the, this workshop. Uh, it's been wonderful. I really appreciate the effort and time people have put into their presentations. Uh, and I hope that also starts a number of discussions for people in the future. So, um, you know, please uh, reach out to you know, anyone who's been in this meeting if you if you felt there were addition, you know, additional discussions we had and such. And I, I hope it leads to uh, productivities of different sorts. So, so thanks everyone for, for being involved. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you both for organizing. Oh yeah, oh, you bet. We really appreciate it. Take care. Yes. You too.